Grace and peace from our eternal Lord and King, our Savior Jesus Christ, fellow children of God. In our gospel lesson that we just read from Mark, Jesus gave some shocking advice. He said, if you have a hand, a foot, or an eye that causes you to sin, get rid of it. He says, cut it off, pluck it out. That's pretty shocking, right? And, and do you think Jesus was being serious about that? Some people might say no, because, well, that seems pretty drastic. But, but think about it a little bit. If losing a foot guaranteed you would have a place in heaven, wouldn't it be worth it? Seems like a small price to pay to get to heaven where it would be restored anyways. Yeah, I think Jesus was being serious about what he said, but at the same time, maybe he was just looking for us to think a little bit deeper. Because even if someone had their hand cut off, would that mean that they would never be able to steal again? Or if someone had a foot cut off, would that mean that they would never be able to walk or go somewhere where they would face temptation? Or if we plucked out an eye, would that mean that we would get rid of all those thoughts of hatred or images of lust that are in our hearts sometimes? Maybe what Jesus was really getting at is, yeah, we want to get rid of what makes us sin, and what makes us sin isn't just our outward extremities but it's what's going on inside our hearts. And so in order to have a place in God's kingdom, that's what we got to deal with, with our sinful nature, with our sinful heart. And as we look at the book of Psalms for this morning, our lesson for this morning, King David reminds us where we can turn to find that incredible change. It doesn't happen by our own determination, by our own effort, but a pure heart comes from God alone. It's all the work of our Lord. He's the one who does everything, and it starts with his law. His law reveals the problem. His law reveals where, where sin really lurks. And so once the law has done its work, we come before the Lord crushed by his law. But then the Lord doesn't leave us in despair because... He's the one who offers us the joy of his forgiveness, the joy of his salvation. And once we hear about what our Lord has done for us, it doesn't end there either because there is no other response except to give him aw- aw- <coughs> excuse me, to give him honor and praise. And so we sing the praises of him who saves us. Uh, for our scripture reading this morning, we turn to the psalm which we had just sung, uh, Psalm 51, and we'll read the last half of that psalm. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem, and then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of our Lord. Psalm 51 is a psalm that was written by King David. And when we think of King David... We see him as a hero of the Old Testament. After he had taken over from King Saul, who had turned away from the Lord, he helped the people to focus on the one true God. And compared to many of the kings that would come after him, he he didn't let the people fall into that same idolatry. But instead, he continued to walk in the ways of the Lord. In fact, 
when Paul was speaking to people in Pisidian Antioch, he said, God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. David was a blessing for the people whom he ruled and a faithful servant of the Lord. And yet at the same time, we also know that David was far from perfect. Even King David was a sinner, just like you and me. And the most egregious sin happened one time when David stayed home instead of going off with his armies to fight. It started with lust in his eyes, but didn't end there. Pretty soon he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and that was bad enough, but when he thought he might be found out, he had to take it even further. He brought Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, home from fighting in the war, and then that didn't work. He had Uriah killed on the front line. David was an adulterer. David was a murderer. David had blood on his hands. And for a while, David may have thought that he had gotten away from it. But there were just a few people who knew what actually had happened. He, he had basically, from a worldly perspective, covered up his sin. But God knew. David couldn't hide from God. And when the time was right, God sent his prophet Nathan to confront David with his sin. And through his prophet, the Lord said to David, Why did you despise the work of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And if you back up and look at the heading of this psalm, this was written not too long after David had committed that sin, had been confronted with his sin, had been, had been led to repent, and was forgiven by the Lord. This is David's response. He, he didn't make excuses. He didn't try to hide it anymore, at least not after the Lord had confronted him. Instead, he came before the Lord, Create in me a pure heart, O God. He knew that it was only by God's power and God's grace that he would be able to be restored. Now, we might look at the sin that David committed and, and be appalled. How could someone whom God had appointed as a leader do such things? But we also know it wasn't the last time something like that happened. And it might be easy for us to look at his sin and say, boy, we would never, ever do anything like that. It's easy for us to look at his sin and say, boy, that's a lot worse than what I'm doing, so I guess I might be doing okay. But that's sort of the tendency of what our human nature does. When we look at someone else's sin, especially if it's sin that's committed against us, boy, that's a horrible atrocity. They are bad people. How could they ever do something like that? But then when we look at our own sin, well, I made a mistake. I had a lapse of judgment. I, I had a bad choice. But God doesn't see our sin that way. God's law treats our sin differently. We might be tempted to think, well, if no one finds out about it, if no one knows about it, well, then maybe we'll get away with it. But just like David, now well, God sees. And he not only sees what we do and hears what we say, but he also even knows what's going on in our hearts. And God makes it clear that every time we sin, it's a sin against his law. It's a sin that makes us guilty. It's a sin that means we have blood on our hands. 
And it doesn't matter if it's something that we might be arrested for or if it's something that might be applauded by our society. It doesn't matter if it's something that we do and everyone sees it or if it's just that thought that lingers in our heart. God sees. And every sin makes us guilty. Uh, The book of James reminds us of that when it says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point of it, is guilty of breaking all of it. God's law takes away all of our excuses. God's law takes away all those different ways we tried to hide our sin. God's law crushes us so that we come before the Lord with a contrite heart. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. But that's why the verse in our scripture reading for this morning gives us so much comfort. It says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. When we come before the Lord with our sin, He has every right to cast away us away from His presence forever. But He doesn't. Instead, he responds with his grace. When David was confronted by Nathan, when he saw his guilt and confessed what he had done, God offered him forgiveness. And it wasn't because of all the sacrifices that David had brought to the temple in the previous years. It was because of the one to whom all those sacrifices pointed. It was because of Jesus, just like it's because of Jesus our sin and guilt is taken away. Because just as God had promised, Jesus came into this world as a descendant of David. And even though he took on human flesh and blood, just like you and me had, me have, he was different. Because already, as he came into this world, he had a pure heart. He had a steadfast spirit. This means that Jesus was always willing and able to do what was right. He always showed love. He always showed compassion. He always saw the devil's temptations for what they were, and even though the world threw every temptation it could in front of Jesus, he always turned away from them so that he could keep himself perfectly. And then Jesus went forward to offer a sacrifice that really meant something. Now, during the time of the Old Testament, so often... The sacrifices were done just out of habit. And yes, God had prescribed all those sacrifices. And yet, so many times people would be tempted just to go through the motions without really thinking about it. And that's why David talks about, well, you don't really want these sacrifices. They didn't think about what all those sacrifices pointed to the promises that they offered, the the pictures that they painted of this Messiah who is coming into the world. But when Jesus came, he gave the once for all sacrifice. He, He gave the sacrifice that meant everything. The book of Hebrews explains, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, when Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. That one sacrifice points to the fact that Jesus was willing to lay down his life for all sinners. Even though Jesus is the only one who never had blood on his hands, he took our blood guilt on himself so that he could pay for it once and for all. And now because Jesus has completed that work, he sits at God's right hand. He has once again taken up his position of power and authority. And as we hear that message of what Christ was willing to do to save us, it's our Lord who provides us with a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. Through the gospel, in word and sacrament, the Holy Spirit breathes new life into each one of us so that we can live as God's people, so that we can stand in his presence, so that we can have the sure hope that we have a place in his kingdom not only today but also for eternity. 
And now as long as we're living in this world, yeah, it's true that every day is going to be a struggle. Every day is going to be a battle. There's always going to be some temptation that's laid in front of us. And every day, because of our sinful human nature, there will be times when we fall into sin. But at the same time, every time we come before the Lord in repentance, every time we come before the Lord, not trusting in what we can do, but instead trusting in what he has promised us. Every time we come before the Lord, he offers us forgiveness. He offers us that that new life. Uh, We also read in the book of Lamentations, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Our Lord sustains us every moment of every day. Our Lord provides a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. And when we see all that our God has done for us, when we, when we know the new heart, the new spirit that he puts in us, we can't help but respond by giving honor and praise to his name. And and once again, David talks about that in our scripture reading for this morning. After God had shown his grace to him, he wanted to proclaim that message of salvation. He wanted to share with others. And it's interesting to note that in the Hebrew, when he talks about sinners, the words refer both to sinners who are trying to do what's right but messed up and sinners who actively rebelled against God. It didn't matter. Sin is sin, but in God there is forgiveness for everyone. And David sang these praises not because he thought he could earn something by it. No, he sang these praises because God had already given him everything. He had answered his prayer and given him a new life in his kingdom. And in the same way, we want to open our mouths to sing the praises of God. We want to tell other people about the great things that he has done. And and this is more than saying, well, we have a powerful God in heaven, or, or we have a God who continues to rule in heaven. To sing God's praises means to also proclaim the incredible things that he has done for us, how he has won our salvation, why he has won our salvation. We want to proclaim those wonderful things that only God can do. And and we do that. If you look at a lot of the hymns that we sing each Sunday, they, they say more than just God is really good. They go into detail about how God accomplished his work so that that message of salvation could be offered to all people according to his grace. And here again, we praise God, not because what we can get out of it, Not because we think it earns something or merits something in God's kingdom. But these are the sacrifices that God is really looking for because they come in response to all that God has already supplied. Uh, As we read in Psalm 30, it says, Sing to the Lord, you saints of him. Praise his holy name. That's our new life singing God's praise, telling what he has done. And as we proclaim this message, it will have an effect. Once again, going back to our psalm, David wrote about that. After God had shown him so much grace, he said he had to proclaim this message. And he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Through that message, God would change hearts and he still does today through that message God's law works to crush us so that people come before the Lord in repentance God's gospel gives us that pure heart it restores to us the joy of salvation it gives us every reason to praise him and so when we understand our guilt there's only one place to turn It's not to our own strength or determination, but we turn to the Lord, the Lord of our salvation, the Lord who saves us. And thanks be to God, he hears and answers our plea for a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. Amen. Now may this grace of God which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
You are welcome to join us at Emanuel Lutheran Church just across the street from the post office in Taylor, Arizona. On Sunday mornings, our Bible study begins at 8.30 and worship begins at 9.30. Let me on. 